This video is sponsored by the following people. Please click the links in the description below. So the next step with this is to heat it up and stick it in a bucket of ash to anneal it, which basically what that's doing in very layman's terms, all of the stuff that's not iron inside the steel, when it's at high temperature, it has an affinity to basically clump together. So what you do is you get it up to its dissolving temperature where all the grains have changed state and then you cool it as slowly as possible and the time at temperature basically allows all of the carbon and the alloying elements to form clumps and what happens then is as you are say drilling or cutting or whatever you cut through all this nice soft iron and the the clumps of carbon will will fly out as an individual chunk whereas if it's very finely dispersed throughout the steel it ties all of the carbon together and you'll have a really difficult time cutting it so one more heat in here and then i'll stick it into a bucket of ash and I just do my annealing in the forge and then I do a completely separate heat treatment for all of the actual heat treating part. This just gets it mechanically soft enough for me to work with. I like to run the forge as low as possible for annealing and I'll also make sure to turn it over so that the heat isn't all coming from one side as that could give it some uneven stress. I'm shooting for about 860 degrees here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to test that it sticks to a magnet or not and then I'm going to go a fair bit over that temperature, roughly about 100 degrees above the, the temperature that it stops sticking to a magnet. It's a very, very rough way of telling temperature. I wouldn't advise it for anything that scientifically matters at the end of the process. Like I said, a mechanical step that gets it easy enough to cut. If I was doing an integral knife or a big stock removal project, I'd put it in the oven and anneal it at the exact temperature to get it as soft as possible. But for this, I really only need to do 20 minutes of grinding, so it's not an issue if it's a little bit harder. Grab my magnet. That's just, just about right. So that doesn't stick there. It wants to stick a little bit there. So I just need five, 10 more seconds. Okay, so that doesn't stick all over now. Right, and now we're ready to go. And, uh, it's very important when you're burying it in the ash, don't let it bend. The amount of times I pulled one out of the anneal and it's uh, quite bent. I believe this is called a spheroid, spheroidizing anneal. So the reason they call it a spheroid anneal is because it makes those clumps of carbon that I was talking about before, which are roughly spherical. I mean, that's a very layman's terms way of explaining it. <laughs> Annealing basically makes the knife as soft as possible, uh, which makes it basically a lot easier to grind. Um, drilling, if we, there was any drilling to do, which there isn't particularly on this one, but essentially it's going to make it a lot easier to grind but then also it disperses all of the alloying elements quite evenly as well. So it's quite a nice pre-step before you start the heat treatment. It puts everything into a fairly nice position and then you can start the heat treatment, which is about firstly dispersing those alloying elements, which we've clumped together when we put it into the anneal. And then once they're evenly dispersed, you then lock it all into place and harden it, which will be pretty much the next two steps. I'll grind it very minorly to shape and then I like to heat treat as thick as possible especially with San Mai I like to heat treat with the whole jacket on just basically as forged so I better put the oven on I suppose so at the moment I'm setting the oven to do normalizing which is a process where we distribute the carbides, the, the alloying elements, basically get them as evenly distributed as possible and to get the grain as fine as possible. And for that we go just a little bit above the final quenching temperature. So I'm going to be going for 860 here. Let's get some of this dust off. Oops. Classic. Go. So that's cooled off now. Just knock all the ash off it. 
right onto the floor, right into the plugs. Perfect. The next step is to uh, grind the profile in. I've got these patterns. I've got lots and lots of different patterns. Sometimes just work completely freestyle, but I do mostly prefer to work from a design. Yeah, this is going to be too small for a number four. So that's going to end up, yeah, that's basically spot on. It's actually going to be just a little bit smaller than my standard number three. See, I'll move the move the, pro, uh, the pattern around a little bit to make small changes. That's pretty much there. I like quite a sharp heel. So the next step is going to be to grind everything outside the black lines. Right then, we're over at the grinder. This table is set to 90 degrees, which is kind of only useful for stock removal stuff to be honest because there's no flat parallel spots anywhere on this knife. One of the things that I simultaneously like a lot about blacksmithing, bladesmithing and dislike a lot is that everything has to be done by the skill of your eye and your hand. Like all of the molecules of the steel are in a different place from when they started as a flat bar and like I said there's no flat parallel sides for you to mark anything off of on here which does make the grinding a little bit more tricky or nuanced than stay a stock removal blade. So I'm just going to get strapped up with my safety gear and then get going. Okay, so that step's done. I always leave material at the tip. This basically acts as a heat sink when you're grinding the tip, so you've got a little bit more time before you burn it or uh, lose the temper. And also when you're hand sanding, a little bit more area to hold the sanding bar flat stops you from messing the tip up. So I will finish the knife completely to say 400 grit and then trim this off on the grinder. And then that's just before it gets glued to the handle, pretty much. So the next step with this is to stamp my logo and then start the heat treatment. Cold stamping works really nicely. And if you use a very small stamp, say mine is barely bigger than a centre punch. It's reliable as long as the metal's annealed or nearly annealed, you can get it in there quite easily. There we go. So that's my logo there. So it used to be a curly H, but um, it evolved over time. I used to do them by electro etching and a much bigger curly sort of thing. And I changed it to be two commas, which sort of form an H, kind of. They also look like a nine and a six, which is convenient because I was born in 96. So it's like double win, really. I, I, I've been using it for years and years. And I like every year, pretty much, I think, oh, maybe I'll buy myself a custom made stamp. but. Actually, I really like my logo. I'd probably stick with it for quite a lot longer. One day, it might be quite nice to have some, you know, curly writing, goth cutlery, made in England, that kind of thing, but probably only for a certain kind of knife anyway. I think I'll keep using this stamp for my forged stuff regardless. Super thank you again to all our Patreon supporters, and we will see you in the next video.